Geothermal is often touted as the world's cleanest renewable, but what does that mean when you dig into the details? Solar, wind, and energy storage projects present often underappreciated environmental impacts, including large footprints, reliance on rare earth mining, less than pristine supply chains, wildlife and microclimate impacts, and poor recyclability at the end of life. For the world to strike the right balance in the energy transition mix, we need to assess clean energy sources and their externalities with honest and objective analysis. There are areas where geothermal shines in terms of environmental impact, like global scalability, small footprint, and baseload capability, which does not require rare earth mining. But there are considerations that require a closer look, including the potential for induced seismicity, emissions to the surface, and the use of fracturing in some geothermal concepts. So how green is geothermal taking all into account? Let's explore. Hello, dear attendees, welcome. My name is Michelle Ramirez. I am Program Officer of the Global Geothermal Alliance at the International Renewable Energy Agency. The Global Geothermal Alliance is a coalition for action to increase the use of geothermal energy for power generation and direct use. It calls on government, business, and stakeholders to support geothermal deployment and realize its potential. We have aspirational goals to achieve five-fold growth in the installed capacity for geothermal power generation and more than twofold growth in geothermal direct use by 2030. I'll be moderating this session titled, How Green is Geothermal? During this session, we'll be talking about some of the main characteristics of geothermal energy as base load status, footprint, life cycles, emissions, and environmental risk. We're ready to compare geothermal with other technologies like wind and solar. Even when most of these characteristics are relevant for power generation, geothermal can also be used to decarbonize different, different industry sectors in a wide variety of direct use applications, another green side of geothermal energy. We have pulled out a fantastic group of speakers to tackle the green side of geothermal energy. We know geothermal energy for being more environmentally friendly than conventional fuel sources, and we will challenge that idea the next 60 minutes to find out really how green is geothermal or what is the information we are missing to address the question. We will work hard to encourage you to take action. Our final goal for this morning is for everybody to write down an action item that you are going to change after our conversation. Please let us know your action items in the chat. Please, Amanda, Kevin, Jeff, and Dev, join me to start the conversation. I will ask you to please uh, introduce yourself with your name, title, entity, and a brief description of what you are working on geothermal. Kevin, you wanna go first? Sure. Hi, I'm Kevin Kitts. I am an independent consultant in the geothermal uh, space. I work on uh, geothermal power innovations, uh, including uh, hybridization with solar thermal. Uh, geothermal heat pump innovations uh, in terms of using geothermal heat pumps to store energy. And uh, I've been working uh, in that for doing geothermal for about 35 years. Based in wow. Boise, Idaho. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Amanda. Yes, hi, my name is Amanda Kolker. I'm a research scientist at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL in Golden, Colorado. I'm a geologist by background, 15 years of experience in the geothermal sector. Um, my background is in volcanology and geochemistry, but I have a very wide range of interests. Um, I spent the first half of my career doing resource exploration and assessment in Western US and Alaska. Um, and then I moved to Europe and switched gears working on geothermal direct use um, and district heating and also facilitating tech transfer between the subsurface energy industries. So oil and gas, carbon sequestration, gas storage, and geothermal energy. About two years ago, I returned to the US to work at NREL, where I lead research projects on a variety of topics, uh, ranging from low temperature to supercritical resources. Um, my motivation the entire time has been linked to climate change and accelerating deployment of geothermal energy. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm really excited to be uh, taking part in this conversation and be here with these distinguished panel members today. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a, my, my name is Jeff Winnick. I'm a geochemist and geologist by training. I've been working professionally for a little more than two decades, 
I began my career in the mining industry, working primarily on water resource management and environmental impacts. Um, I think that gave me a, a much deeper appreciation for the concept behind the saying, you know, if it can't be grown, it has to be mined. Um, I think that's never really been more relevant than it is today. And the extent to which our choices as consumers impacts the environment and it does this through this really complex web of supply chains. So uh, it's also given me an appreciation for the inextricable linkage between water and energy and minerals. So maybe we'll touch on some of these things as they intersect with renewables. So uh, as for the geothermal portion of my career, about 12 years ago, I switched over to the geothermal, um, moved to greener pastures, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Since that time, I've been working in uh, greenfield exploration projects throughout South America, later in uh, geothermal development and operations in New Zealand. I'm now based in Golden, Colorado in my current role with Boston Government Services, where I provide technical advisory support to the DOE's Geothermal Technologies Office. Uh, so I was first brought into that role about five years ago to manage, write, and deliver the DOE's Geovision project and report. Um, and since that time, I've been providing support across most of GTO subprograms and strategic initiatives. So uh, thanks again for having me here today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jeff. And last but not least, Dev. Hi, all. Um, I'm Dev Milstein, and I'm a research scientist at Berkeley Labs, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I have a background in atmospheric science and also in air quality. Um, and I've been working a lot recently looking at um, value of wind and solar and geothermal as well as it changes over time um, in the energy and capacity markets. And I've also spent some time looking at the value of externalities in, uh, from renewable sources. Uh, including working with Jeff on the GeoVision project. Um, so I've also looked at sort of the air quality and health benefits of geothermal and also wind and solar and uh, climate benefits as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, now that we all know each other, let's get the conversation started to find out how green is geothermal and if we know how green it is or how can we measure its cleanness? So I will propose you the first question of this panel. What research has been done comparing emissions of different uh, sources of energy and what are the outcomes? I'm not sure if probably Dev, you would like to talk about this? Sure. Um, you know, like typically to compare emissions across uh, electricity generating technologies. We use life cycle um, measurements. So that means including operational emissions, but also the upstream uh, emissions for mining and manufacturing. Um, but there, there's the short answer, is, well, so, that, so you can do life cycle emissions for uh, carbon, but also for air pollutants like uh, SOx and NOx, those are criteria air pollutants or, or other types of air pollutants as well. Or um, uh, you can even do it for, for, for water impacts as well. But I mainly look at the air pollution side. Um, and, and really in, in terms of power generation, the operation side is usually dominant because you create a power plant and then it lasts for a really long time and so in most cases, the sort of upstream emissions um, that come from manufacturing the materials for the power plant get sort of washed out over you know, 30 years of, of generating. Uh, basically what you find is that geothermal, PV, wind, nuclear, these are all extremely clean, basically, um, you know, Geothermal binary, for example, I, I have numbers of like 10 kilograms per megawatt hour um, emissions for CO2 on a life cycle basis. Wind is maybe like 20 kilograms, PV is somewhere a little bit above that. But then like uh, natural gas is more like, you know, on the order of 500 and coal is about on the order of 1,000. So 
a really, it's almost sort of like a, a binary choice to not the geothermal binary, but basically you have uh, uh, power plants that burn fuel during operations and those just have huge environmental impacts. And then you have power plants that don't burn fuel during operations and you have very small environmental impacts. So that's sort of my, my um, zoomed out take on the issue. Thank um, you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, probably, I'm not sure, probably Jeff or Kevin would like to add to this conversation. Maybe uh, talking about more like comparisons between technologies, uh, for instance, probably solar. If we can say solar is a zero emission technology. Kevin, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I missed the button there. Um, I think it's interesting to, so that's at the power plant. I think that a lot of discussion around geothermal, and this applies not only to emissions, but also to price has to do with looking at the power plant standing alone instead of looking at the power plant as part of a grid. So the real, the real goal of course, is not to decarbonize, um, the power plant, the real goal is to decarbonize the grid. And so the integration costs are also really important, both financially um, and the emissions that they cause. And I think that in this is an area where geothermal has a, has a big advantage um, in both areas because it doesn't require, um, it, it, it doesn't have integration emissions um, for, you know, let's say, um, the duck curve um, in California as the as the as solar ramps that is currently mostly met with um, gas fired power plants and so that that is going to be um, an emission a grid a, an overall grid emission that doesn't exist for geothermal you know, on the other hand geothermal will never supply the entire California grid so it's it really needs to be an, it's an it's a very inclusive um, approach to take, to get all of these going, because we're going to need them all. Hey, Jeff, do you like to add something to this uh, point? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would probably just echo a lot of what Kevin just said about the importance of, of the uh, system yeah. integration impacts and costs. Um, you know, not, not all electricity is created equal and it's not really, it, it's, it's not just about getting cheap, clean energy. We, we need to get cheap, clean energy where, where we need it and when we need it. And that is going to have an impact to deliver, deliver those things to the grid um, as, as we need it. So um, yes, I think the, I think it's just vitally important that we, because the grid is, is such a complex multi-dimensional uh, beast, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we need to start thinking about it at a system level and um, considering for each technology that we want to add incrementally to that grid, what is the cost and the impact to do that? Okay, uh, maybe that here the question is like, if we could say that geothermal is carbon free at some point, or what are, what we need to know about that or what we need to analyze on that topic. If I could interject here. Yeah. yeah. Please, Amanda, please. Yeah, so in terms of decarbonization, um, I would agree with what my panelists um, have said. You know, from a decarbonization perspective, geothermal is deeply green technology since it's baseload, right? Because it, only baseload renewables can allow for a fully decarbonized system. Like, and um, Jeff just mentioned, but I, I like, I, I've been wondering lately if geothermal is doubly green or even triply green because we can't, we don't just provide one type of energy. We, we can provide electrical energy, you know, where we have resources available and economic. We can also provide thermal energy and we can provide storage. And, you know, arguably from the perspective of human energy needs, you know, in that way, it's kind of triply baseload um, and triply green because, you know, human energy needs include thermal energy for heating and cooling, 
um, arguably more than they need electrical energy, um, and that could be debated. Um, and so, you know, by supplying both of these types of energy renewably and baseload, we are getting all of those emissions, you know, we are avoiding all of those emissions that would otherwise be met by fossil sources. Um, and then in terms of storage, you know, we don't require peaking, like Kevin said, by fossil sources. We also don't require battery storage. And uh, not only that, but we can do that. We can do that for other technologies. That's why I think Kevin mentioned that we, you know, it's, it's a very complementary technology to variable um, renewable sources. So does that make us strictly green um, by providing those three base load energy needs? In terms of decarbonization, but decarbonization is not the only thing that we think about with green. So. Absolutely agree. We are already receiving some questions of our audience. So we have a question to Dev. Dev, uh, when it comes to comparisons uh, between solar and wind and geothermal, uh, have you looked at the LA, LCE uh, when uh, PV or wind farm are decommissioned early? The commission early, excuse me. And if you know anything in those comparisons, life yeah. cycle analysis, yeah. Um, it, it it definitely would harm the uh co the levelized cost if you de decommission something early. And um, I haven't seen that. That's a widespread problem as of yet. There's been a lot of repowering for wind power recently uh, to sort of get a, in order to get a sort of second shot at the PTC. So, I mean, this is sort of a side issue, but um, that's, that's been driving a lot of the sort of refurbishing of wind plants, not necessarily that they're, they're not working anymore, um, but they're putting up new, bigger turbines and, and different technology. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we want to talk about costs, like, I mean, sort of, sort of the way I see these integration issues for geothermal, and and this is really on the electricity side, not so much on the thermal side, because thermal uh, geothermal has um, has some sort of some sets of unique benefits and opportunities there. But on the electricity side. Um, sort of in the longer term deep decarbonization view, the, the studies I've seen basically select geothermal sort of out to its technical potential, at least in the Western US. Um, and so there's no, I mean, when, you, when you're going to like really deep decarbonization, the barriers for geothermal growth sort of fall away to the technical barriers rather than the economic barriers. But in, in the near term, the, the real challenge for geothermal, even thinking about you know, the integration issues is that basically all the new solar coming online in California is gonna be paired with battery storage. And so, I mean, this is really the challenge for any new capacity coming online has to compete with solar plus battery storage and that's currently signing PPAs at around $30 per megawatt hour. And um, so it's just a really um, low cost, low price bar to beat. And so that's sort of the near term challenge for, for geothermal, whereas sort of the longer term perspective, uh, when you get into sort of deeper decarbonization um, scenarios where uh, You've sort of maxed out the role of four hour energy storage. That's that's the kind that's being paired with solar now. Uh, that's when you start really selecting your, your geothermal for growth. And so there's a there's like a time issue that I see for geothermal that's challenging. If I oh sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> well, I was uh, I was actually gonna prompt you to maybe talk about uh, one of your analogies, but um, before, before I do that, I, I was going to say, I think, I think one of the, the key issues that Dev's hitting on here is the intrinsic value of these technologies um, and bringing uh, costs, market, market prices more in line uh, 
with what the intrinsic value is. And it, it may well be that the market is just poorly informed of the full value of the services and, and capabilities that geothermal can bring, not just from the electricity side, as Amanda has pointed out, but also in heating and cooling. Um, but I, I do, you know, I wanted to virtually look at you, Kevin, because I know there's a, a <laughs> an analogy uh, that, that you might want to talk about there. Well, I think, um, thanks, Joe. If I, one thing I, I, will, I want to clarify is what Dev said, the technical limit versus just um, in case everybody on the audience doesn't know what he's um, referring to there. I think that's the the technical limit is is just simply how much geothermal can actually be put on the grid technically that that there's enough resource for it so you know if you've got a hundred megawatt resource the technical limit is 100 megawatts so um is that right dev is that what is that what you meant is just how much is actually uh, physically yeah. out there yeah yeah and i i and i don't think that includes like i mean in in the geovision we looked at sort of breakthroughs in technology and development for enhanced geothermal thermal resource. And so I don't think it, the studies I've looked at consider that specifically in terms of decarbonization. So okay, sort of the, the current known technical limit. Yeah, so I, I've uh, tried to sell a lot of geothermal power. Um, when I first started selling it, coal was still acceptable and people, power companies said, Oh, we love geothermal as long, uh, you know, we'll take as much of it as we can get as long as it doesn't cost one one thousandth of a cent more than filthy, dirty coal. And in today's world, it's exactly the same line, except that it can't cost one one thousandth of a cent more than solar. But this is the basic problem is that the grid, the grid cannot get by on even today on PV and battery alone. Um, batteries are way, way, way more than $30 a megawatt hour. And what you're really seeing when you hear things like that is a very small battery hooked to a very large PV array. Um, uh, and, you know, the problem is, is that the U.S. has this huge inventory of um, and I don't know about, I think this is not applicable in, in much of the rest of the world, but in the US, we have this huge um, inventory of simple cycle and combined cycle gas turbines. And they're already paid for, or they're already sunk costs. And so their, their cost to integrate um, PV and wind is simply the cost to burn the fuel. The actual capital costs, operating costs, everything else is not included and so that is the big barrier that that geothermal faces and it's the same issue for the greenness that's what i was getting at so um and the and the problem with using these sunk costs is that we are building a system that it that is totally dependent on having them in the future which means that they will have to be replaced and at which point they will not be zero cost um, you know, and, and there are multi-day, even in California, there are multi-day periods, typically in January, where there's virtually no solar or wind on the grid. Geothermal continues on completely uninterrupted, but, but solar and wind basically disappear for multi-day periods. Well, that intrinsically means that you have to have fossil fired backup. It's not that the emissions are that large, it's over the course of the year, over many years, it's that the carrying cost of those power plants is there. And so comparing the PPA price of geothermal and solar, and I think this is the analogy that, that it's, a, it's an incomplete comparison. It's like comparing, well, I won't say it. it it's, it's, it's just completely not equal comparisons in my opinion. So oh, great. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a good point, but it's I, I think that I mean there's a timing mismatch because the like critical issues for grid stability and times when we no longer can easily integrate solar and storage in 
um, are not quite here yet. In California, it's still only 20% solar, 20% of the energy is coming from solar. Um, but de deep decarbonization, we'll probably get, uh, I don't remember exactly, but you know, most of our energy from solar, most likely. And so when we're in that sort of phase where California and the West is getting most of its energy from solar, then the value of an additional wind and solar project will be much lower because of the integration costs. But right now, the value of an additional wind and solar, I mean, solar and storage plant is, is really high. Um, and so somewhere between now and when we get to really high penetration of solar, um, the value will flip and then geothermal will be in a much more competitive position. But, but right now it's quite challenging. Uh, even if you think about uh, integration costs. At, so, so I, I, that's my, my, my thought is like, I agree, I agree with that, but we're not quite there yet. And so until we get there, it's going to be a really challenging time uh, to push geother geothermal forward um, without other changes, uh, at least on the electricity side. Um, so I, I don't want to make this point for the thermal side because that's it's not the same issues on the thermal side. So okay, well, what I think what we call a uh, question now is uh, when we compare renewables, we also need to measure those externalities that we can be missing to avoid have some how uh, hidden costs. So are we working on that or? we should be working on that and how we can uh, avoid this, this kind of topics. How can we tackle it? Amanda, you, do you want to jump in? Sure, yeah. So um, I, I think that your question is related to Dev's um, point just now, which is, you know, we, we don't value a lot of things that we, well, we don't um, monetize or internalize the cost of a lot of things we value, right? So for a while, um, even and arguably today <laughs> in the United States, even emissions, you know, we know we we value avoiding them, but it's very unevenly applied that internalization. There's it's still extern an, an externality in all states, pretty much except for California and a few eastern northeastern states, right? In the electricity market, when it comes to the heating and cooling sector. Emissions, you know, there's no real incentive at this point to go off natural gas. Um, we have no um, financial or political incentive to change into a renewable based uh, heating and cooling system because um, thermal energies don't have the same type of, um, for example, you know, uh, cap and trade or all of the different carbon pricing mechanisms that have been in in installed in the United States are all related to electricity production. Um, that was the case in Europe, uh, that the internalization of emissions was uneven, and they're starting to rectify that. But here in the US, it's still very uneven, and again, doesn't apply to thermal energy. So I think starting with emissions was a great way to set the stage, because that was something that was totally external to the market and is now being internalized slowly, and with a lot of starts and stops. But there are other things, right? Like, I think the point, I think the word that we're trying to get to is the resilience. Um, how we value resilience as a society. I mean, the Texas situation showed us what happens when you have an unresilient or vulnerable grid. Um, you know, California is facing resilience issues, and but that is not internalized. That is completely external. Um, so, you know, when you look at the, that's, you know, I completely agree with Kevin's point about LCOE is, you know, when you look at the baseline costs and things like resilience are not included in that, then that's not the only decision um, point, right? You, you, your community, you're trying to decide what energy source you want to uh, deploy um, for powering and for heating your system. You're not only thinking about cost, you're thinking about resilience, but it's not factoring into the economic models. And so I think that Dev's point about timing 
is right, but I think it could be changed quicker than just letting the market drive these things if we start to be proactive, not just the geothermal industry, but the entire renewable energy industry in internalizing things like resilience, internalizing other, you know, we haven't talked about other externalities. Um, I know Kevin and Jeff do a lot of thinking about this. Um, so, you know, if emissions isn't the only externality we're trying to integrate, but we're really taking a holistic picture, um, you know, including things like sunk costs, for example. So I'll stop talking. Um, but I think that's exactly where, you know, geothermal will excel. We can start getting those costs internalized. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. We have a few questions of our audience. Uh, are there any situations where geothermal could be carbon neutral and what are they? Uh, probably Jeff could jump into this question regarding carbon neutral. Um, I mean, it's probably carbon negative already is, would be my response to that. Um, especially, again, considering all the things that we've been talking about. If you, if you you have to be thinking uh, outside of just the fence, if we're only looking behind the fence, um, even on a life cycle analysis basis, I think it's still car carbon negative uh, as a technology. Um, but I think the case is, you know, like everything, echoing everything we've been talking about, I think the case is even more compelling when we start looking system-wide uh, impacts. Um, I wanted to just jump back to your question, Michelle, for a minute, and as far as like, how, how can we get at the externalities? Um, this is something that I know we've, we've been thinking a lot about um, recently. And, and I think it really is gonna come down to uh, just capturing as much high fidelity data as we possibly can uh, on the costs and performance of the technologies. Uh, but then beyond that, um, it's gonna require a lot of rigorous analysis and modeling studies in, in my opinion. To, to be looking at things like avoided costs and avoided impacts. So testing out at a system-wide basis, what happens when you integrate one technology versus another um, and, and how impactful that is for, for the grid in, in terms of, uh, you know, what we should all be striving for is, is the, the most efficient, uh, least cost way to remove carbon out of the grid. Like, I think that's probably where we need to shift the conversation from uh, away from things that are focused on levelized cost basis, because when you, when you start talking about how do you, how do you get carbon out of the grid, if that's really ostensibly what we're all here to try to do, um, that's when the intrinsic value of these technologies really comes through and starts to, to have, uh, well, you would, you would hope the market would start to, to price it in a bit more appropriately. So um, yeah, I'll hand that back to you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We have another question from our audience. Um, if uh, they want to see if we see tension in the future between geothermal and uh, solar and wind, of if they're going to work together happily. Uh, what do you think? I think we could be all thinking about some kind of um, balance matrix between renewables. Well, what do you think? It is kind of a, of a real uh, tension between technologies? I don't think so. Um, I, I, think they're, I think they're all critically important, including as Jeff mentioned early on nuclear. Um, you know, wind and solar, I mean, if are just simply not going to ever, it's going to be very expensive to have them provide power at night. It's going to be very expensive to have them provide power during the during long periods where um, you know atmospheric conditions are such that their output drops way off. Um, and so, uh, an integrated an integrated solution is going to uh, that integrates all of these technologies is is going to be the best. Um, and I'm, I'm always hearing just, we've already had a couple of questions about, you know, is it zero carbon? Nothing, nothing can ever be zero carbon. Um, we've, we've um, you know, we can, we can be carbon negative relative to where we are, but 
if you can see it, then there was energy used to produce it and that, and it emitted. So, and I, I think this was one of the surprising things that Dev started the conversation with is that, is that the life cycle carbon emissions of solar and wind were actually higher than geothermal, you know, slightly, um, but that, but that, you know, both were orders of magnitude lower than, than um, fossil. And so I, I think we need to, to recognize that. I think, I think though that the, this, these externalities, this, the externalities, part of those are the grid and, and everything else that's running on the grid. And, and that was Jeff's point about, you know, we have to decarbonize and, and the point that I made earlier too, we have to decarbonize the grid. We have to, when we add power plants, we look at the grid as a whole and not at, you know, the output from that particular power plant. And, and when we do that, we're going to see a lot more uh, need for geothermal uh, power. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Kevin. And uh, we also received a couple of questions of the audience regarding the oil and gas engagement. Uh, first one is, is oil and gas engagement in this sector going to make geothermal be less green in terms of public perception? What do you think uh, regarding this engagement between oil and gas and geothermal? Well, I think you've uh, got, a, uh, got a bunch uh, of technical people on. on well, I can, <laughs> I can bring my experience. Um, uh, you know, Europe made the oil and gas to geothermal transition a few years ahead of us in the U.S. and was there for that. And um, I mean, it's still going on. And <clears throat> it's I'm oversimplifying it by calling it that. But um, um, think, Amanda, what what does that mean? What is the oil to gas uh, transition? I mean, sorry, the geothermal oil, the gas to geothermal transit transition mean in Europe? Good question. So it means that, um, you know, the industry, not just, you know, the producing the majors, but also um, the oil field um, service companies and the geophysics companies that have supported exploration for resources and, you know, the entire subsurface energy industry around oil and gas that was built to explore, understand, characterize, extract, transport, combust, all those chain steps is now shifting a bit. You know, the producers are going a little slower, but uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of companies that don't actually, you know, that are outside of the, the majors, um, especially in, in Europe where there's little oil fields that are still run by small scale operators. And, um, you know, when they internalize the cost of emissions by, introducing carbon taxes, um, they, you know, basically incentivized some of these. And, and then there was targeted incentives for some of these industries to go to geothermal um, with respect to wells, for example. Um, so, you know, it's still early on in, in a transition. Um, but I guess one issue um, that was also brought up in the chat here was, um, you know, taking tech transfer from oil and gas methods to geothermal, one in particular, you know, is utilizing um, hydraulic fracturing for enhanced geothermal systems. Um, <clears throat> and the question, I'm shifting topics a little bit here, but that, you know, this is one area where I think we have, have to tread lightly and be very careful in terms of green, because um, I think in Europe, public perception of geothermal has been impacted a lot by um, induced seismic events related to EGS, um, uh, mostly injection, um, not so much actually the fracking part, but the, um, you know, I think even me using that word, I'm, I'm regretting because I, I think we need to be really clear about what we're doing and how it's different and um, maintain our green perception really carefully, you know, but I think we can, I think, you know, for example, in the beginning of the hydrothermal period, I wouldn't say geothermal was a very green industry, you know, we went in, we extracted, you know, reinjection wasn't particularly um, well done in the beginning of our industry. And now we've kind of mastered it. We know how to keep reservoirs sustainable and renewable over time. We know how to not contaminate the surface. We know how to, um, you know, basically mitigate the environmental impacts that were an issue in the beginning. 
I think the same goes for new technologies. Um, I think, you know, um, the oil and gas sector does need to be mindful that our green perception is really one of our selling points. And, um, and, and once public perception changes around how green your technology is, it's really hard to get that back. I saw that in Europe. You know, the European public does not understand the difference between enhanced geothermal um, systems and typical conventional hydrothermal. So this is a tricky issue that if we can avoid in the United States, um, should in terms of clarifying, you know, what our technologies are. And um, yeah, I, I'll stop there. But I think, um, I, th I think we can stay green, but I think it will take work. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And I have another question. Is geothermal a low hanging fruit for the oil and gas sector now that we're talking about the oil and gas sector in geothermal? Do you see like a long hanging fruit? Kevin? Uh, yes, I think I think the I think the big challenge for oil and gas is to make it economically significant. So you've got uh, you know billions of dollars that you need to invest every year. The current geothermal industry just it, you know just it, it can't provide that level of investment. It seems to me. And so I'm, I'm really excited about uh, things like EGS that provide that uh, potential to invest billions. Um, uh, because I, I think then, then, that, then that will allow them to move into it. I, I think that I'm not too worried about, I'm not too worried about public perception. Um, I, I think that the um, band is, is good, but I, I think if if they're if they're delivering green goods, they're gonna have the public is gonna know that, and I think I think the outcome is going to be more important than than who's doing it. I I believe outcome will be the most important driver there. So those those are some thoughts. If I could add something to that, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what Kevin just said, and um, and I think that uh, it's important for us to to consider that wind and solar um, they sort of uh, they're they're visible technologies. They're they're sort of in your face, and they sell themselves as green, and that's because there's been a multi-decadal public awareness campaign uh, behind those industries, which has you know, educated the public on, on the benefits of wind and solar. I, I would say geothermal really hasn't had that same, hasn't been able to benefit from that in the same way. Um, you know, geothermal power plants, really all geothermal technologies are very low impact in terms of land use. Power plants are low profile. You can have cattle grazing amidst, you know, amidst a well field. Um, it's, it coexists well with other natural resource use in that, in that respect. Um, but that's in some ways sort of a, a marketing problem for geothermal that people, people will drive right past it and they, they won't even know that they're looking at a geothermal power plant, whereas they can see, you know, uh, wind farms and solar panels, solar rays from long distance away. So um, I do think public awareness and perception is ultimately important, um, but I agree with Kevin that, you know, the 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 benefits of geothermal will will come through and the public will be should be aware of that and, and they'll come on board but I, I do think that our industry collectively will have some work to do to uh, to make sure that that's that's recognized thank you thank you jeff so are we measuring all pros and cons cons of geothermal base load footprint life cycle flexibility, are, are we really measuring all that or we are just looking at um, megawatts? What do you think? In my opinion, I think there's there's additional work to be done. Certainly, I mean, there have been, uh, and, and I think this is something that Amanda and Dev can probably speak to in terms of what, what types of studies have been done in life cycle impacts and historically. There has been work done in this in this area in the past, but 
you know, the technology has evolved and not just ours, but, uh, but, you know, competing, you know, renewable technologies. And so there's probably a lot of instances where we're, we're due for some updates and in, in, in looking at these, these metrics again. Um, and, uh, and also looking at things like um, uh, land use and land use impacts in particular, I think. Yeah, I, uh, the land use impacts, you know, that's, it's some, the, some of the problem is that some of these values or impacts are hard to quantify sort of on a dollar basis. So land use impacts, that's pretty challenging to quantify. Um, and uh, even things like resilience are somewhat challenging to quantify. I mean, we have capacity markets but I don't think that counts for things like uh, Black Start or other aspects of resilience that are sort of outside those direct capacity markets. Um, and so one of the challenges is, is that it's just a little hard to quant quantify these things. Yeah, I would agree with Dev and, and, and Jeff on that. Um, you know, at NREL, a lot of what we do is, is simulate the cost and performance of renewable energy technology, but a lot of time we do that for one technology in particular, or maybe we'll compare it to a fossil source, but there's less work around comparing re renewables to one another. Um, and a lot of that is, is really just how do we account for things? And especially when it comes to thermal energy, again, we're just not, you know, it doesn't, um, you know, we know how to measure electrons. Um, <laughs> BTUs are a little bit more of a specialized little niche. Um, and, you know, so what happens is a lot of time, if you're thinking about a geothermal CHP system, for example, combined heat and power, uh, it's just completely left out because we don't have any way to compare it. There is no, you know, system model set up to compare that to say a typical grid where you've got, you know, multiple um, renewable and fossil sources feeding into an electricity generation um, system. And then you've got a natural gas pipeline, you know, it, there's just too many, um, apples and oranges there. So I think a lot of it, like Jess said, has come back to what our modeling tools are and their limitations. Um, you know, there is a lot of work being done, um, again, at the specific technology scale. Um, and, you know, outside of resilience, which I agree with Des point, you know, no model is set up to capture the entire value proposition of geothermal. Um, we've been trying to think about it at NREL for a while, and it's, it's a hard, problem to tackle because of this difficulty to quantify that Deb brought up. Okay, absolutely agree. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And we, we haven't talked yet about dispatchability and flexibility. And is it an attribute we should be pushing for in geothermal? Um, I'll, I'll wait in there. No, I don't think it is. <laughs> just a great way to raise geothermal cost without providing benefit. I think there's, this is, uh, in the fossil world, when the grid was fossil based, you cut the most expensive plant first and the least expensive plant last. And that, that made good economic sense. But in the renewable world, it's exactly the opposite. And I don't think that the world has actually started to think about that yet. Um, there are no variable costs. There is no cost savings for any renewable plant by cutting its, by cutting its output. And so the, the best one to cut is surprisingly the cheapest one. When there's too much power on the grid, you leave the expensive geothermal running and you cut the cheap solar because that's the cheapest way to do it. Um, I, you know, I do think we should, we focused on we keep focusing on power and that's great, but I, I don't know if you want to take some time, Michelle, to talk about geothermal heat. Absolutely. Well. Please, Kevin, go ahead. Um, so geothermal heat pumps are, are probably the, the most super green renewable technology there can be. Um, and they are so fantastic because they actually enable more solar and wind to be on the grid. Um, because um, so, and they also cut emissions more than any other technology. Um, so when you have a geothermal pump in an air conditioning mode, it's you're gonna use about half the power. So if you look at what's the power that's being, what, what are the power sources that are providing peak uh, 
providing power at peak hours, it's it's gas turbines, some cycle gas turbines. The coal plants are all running at full blast. And if you cut 100 megawatts like that um, from a from the grid, the only thing that's going to back down is is gas and is is simple cycle gas turbines. And so geothermal heat pumps are are really impactful for grid emissions. And uh, the same by this and and they also provide super efficient heating so they do decarbonize heating and so this is this is one of geothermal's greatest strengths um, and and furthermore you can actually actively store grid energy in the ground um, to make geothermal heat pump systems more efficient and less costly so i'll i'll drop it off there and see if anybody else has anything to add but i think this is a really key part of geothermal's greenness um yeah. uh, I, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay well i was just gonna say in in the geothermal vision we had a section on ground heat pumps and um we were surprised at how big the potential benefits were from an expansion of that industry um so i would echo kevin's thoughts on on ground heat pumps Yes, um, and I would also point out that um, we were in the in the geovision when we looked at heat pumps, we were looking at uh, uh, market based potential, um, and and I think in uh, you know given the change in times right now, we might want to set our targets a little a little bit more aggressively, trying to go after you know a larger chunk of the full economic potential, not just the market potential because the impacts could be so substantial. Um, I think, uh, yeah, having, uh, Kevin hit on a lot of really great points about heat pumps. And, and I think especially as we push really hard towards deep decarbonization and, you know, right now the, the, the running assumption seems to be with full elect electrification that heating and cooling is gonna be provided by air source heat pumps. And I, and I know this is something that um, you know, Kevin can can probably and Amanda can talk more about as well. But uh, you know, in terms of an efficiency, uh, a grid efficiency improvement, and reducing peak loads, reducing average loads, um, geothermal heat pumps go a long way towards reducing the burden to electrify to to achieve really high electrification. They more equitably spread that burden, at least. So the burden is not just all on solar and wind to provide capacity, but if we can actually improve the efficiency of heating and cooling, then you just, you know, the, the least impact renewable is the one that you don't have to build in the first place, right? So it, it's, I think that's, we should keep that in mind. So um, I'll send it back to whoever else wants to chime Thank in. Thank you, Jeff. Amanda, can you point out something? Regarding geothermal heat pumps? Actually, I don't, I mean, I think the point is really well made. Um, I think both Kevin and, and Jeff and also Deb just hit, hit it on the, on the head there. Um, uh, you know, I actually did want to go back to that point about flexibility, um, just to make the debate a little bit more lively here. I would like to respectfully disagree a bit with Kevin and he's right. I mean, Kevin's right that, you know, the value to the grid in terms of geotech flexibility is, is definitely debatable. Um, and, and, you know, there is going to be an additional cost for that that would be hard to pencil out. I would just bring the perspective of, of the microgrid, which is a little bit futuristic. Um, geothermal microgrids are not widely deployed right now, um, but they could be, um, and that's mostly a function of cost. There's also, you know, um, some integration issues with standalone islanded microgrids from geothermal, but those can be overcome that, um, and have been, actually in some settings. And so I just wanted to point out, you know, the Puna geothermal power plant in Hawaii was set up to be flexible and it has added resilience to that grid. Um, and so when you're talking about an island setting or a microgrid setting where, you know, I think Kevin's point applies very well to a national grid, right? Or a large scale grid. But when it comes to a small grid or an islanded grid, a microgrid, you do need that flexibility and we'll need a baseload renewable energy source that is flexible. So, um, you know, 
microgrids have been a little bit less of a focus of you know this entire problem that we have to solve because just because of they're small, but they will become very important in the future and they're already becoming important in California. So I think flexibility is important in some settings. Uh, I'm glad you went back to flexibility, Amanda, because it's something that I, I wanted to touch on a little bit as well. Um, and, and I, you know, maybe we can, we don't have much time left, but uh, have a little bit more of a conversation about this because, you know, I, I think one of the visions with massive adoption of EGS in the future, and if we're moving in again into deep decarbonization where with, with lots of solar and wind on the grid, where flexibility becomes a highly valued attribute of a potential power generation technology. Um, this is sort of a question for everybody, but does that then, I mean, I understand that's maybe not the, the core capability of geothermal, but technically it's able to do it. Does that then make it worth our while to at least consider that if we are going to this very broad, large scale adoption of, of EGS type systems? So just to ask a question here, like my understanding is that technically for binary geothermal plants, it's relatively easy to provide down ramping. Um, and even for flash plants, if there's a bypass installed, then it's pretty easy. I don't know what the costs are for that, but um, so there, there's a certain amount of flexibility that's relatively easy to achieve. Is that, is that correct? Well, it can I mean, be, I would say. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, it's um, it's possible. It's important to notice that when you say bypass, though, there you're only you're only by you know the resource is still being consumed. It's just not producing anything useful. So, um, you know, it's it's um, it's not like there's a tub of water that that isn't being drained. Um, that's not the way geothermal works, of course. So, um, but it, you know, any, anything's possible with money and, and, and uh, Amanda is, is right on, on, for sure on small, small areas, it's, it's highly to be able to, to have your, your plant ramp up and down reliably. Yeah, I, I see a lot of conversation out there about how can we make power electronics achieve this or how, how can we invest research, uh, how can we do research investments to, to make solar and wind basically be things that they aren't. Um, when we already have, you know, we have a singular example with Puna, I mean, my understanding is historic examples of the geysers, but you know, there are deployed examples of geothermal power plants running flexibly right now. So to me, it begs the question of, which which avenue we we want to choose, especially if we are going to a a mass adoption uh, type of paradigm. Thank you, thank you all of you. Uh, well, finally, we have five minutes for closing remarks. One minute each each of us. So, Jeff, you go first. Closing remarks. One minute. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, well, so yeah, just to. Just to close it out, I think it's really important, like a, like a, we've echoed throughout this today's session, that we start focusing on the bigger picture and thinking about the system as a whole and considering the integration costs and impacts. Um, and it's not, you know, as Deb has alluded to, the analysis required to, to fully capture the complexity of supply chains and all the upstream impacts associated with, with these things is not easy or even things, things that should be, you know, like land use impacts. These are not easy things to monetize, but we, we need to make an effort at it because they are part of the intrinsic value proposition that geothermal and other technologies would bring. So if you're gonna be able to, to compare things on a fair basis, we need to be capturing these things best we can. Thank you, Jeff. Amanda, one minute for your closing remarks. Sure. Yeah, I completely agree with Jeff for the you know need of these type of analyses. They can be done. Um, you know, again, these costs um, can be internalized and thought of, um, and have been you know over time. 
um, more and more internalized. And every time they are, geothermal does better. <laughs> so, um, and I would just, you know, again, come back to the point that geothermal can provide power, we can provide heat, we can provide storage um, through ground source heat pumps or through underground thermal energy storage. So we, you know, we need to also be considering the externalities for all of those markets um, and seeing these as integrated holes, like Jeff said. Um, and, and I think once we do, then it will be obvious how geothermal is green. Um, the other thing is we need to really, I believe um, that our, we need to do work on maintaining our um, greenness and you know, learning from Europe, um, <clears throat> which does have a social acceptance problem um, for, of geothermal. You know, and one thing I would say is, um, as the EGS industry matures in the United States, we can also look to Europe for you know, non-hydraulic fracking EGS solutions. They're out there, you know, chemical solutions. Um, so I think you know things that become a little bit of a green hangup for us, we instead of brushing them under the rug and ignoring them, we need to be transparent. We need to address them as an industry because uh, this day and age, the public's not going to ignore things like that. Um, so instead, you know, uh, that's that's my belief um, at, because I feel strongly that that is our selling point. Thank you, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, Dev, your closing remarks. Sure. So, I mean, I guess I would start with externalities and I think the big externalities are, are really the climate benefits of running geothermal. And I think those are huge. They're, they're probably on the order of magnitude or slightly bigger than the actual uh, energy system value right now, the energy markets and the capacity markets. Um, and so, that's the elephant in the room. Um, and realizing those benefits uh, for geothermal, there's, they're roughly similar for wind and solar, but there's just room for everyone given those large external benefits that are not currently in the markets. Um, and so there's room for everyone to grow. Uh, in terms of long-term deep decarbonization, I think you can kind of think of geothermal as like a limiting reagent in terms of costs, like uh, long term cost of deep decarbonization is going to be sensitive to the cost of geothermal in some regions. Um, and less sensitive to other things like the cost of storage or so cost of solar so incremental improvements in the cost of solar and storage won't really increase their um, deployment in the long run, but incremental costs. Uh, ben, uh, benefits for, for geothermal will substantially increase its uh, deployment, um, I guess, within the limits of uh, the technical potential. So uh, there's a lot of growth ahead for geothermal in terms of the perspective of deep deep carbonization, but in the near to medium term, I think it's quite challenging. And so that's sort of the lay of the land that I, that I see. Thank you, Dev. Finally, Kevin, your closing remarks, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, panelists, for an interesting discussion today. And um, I, I think that uh, we, we said we had a goal of, uh, of having any audience members uh, um, try, to take a take, uh, try to take an action item. And I think for me, the action item I'd like to see them uh, consider is to really be able to talk about the difference between and understand the implications of the difference between a power plant grid, a, a power plant cost and emissions compared to the grid cost and emissions. I think this is a really critical thing for, um, for geothermal power. Um, and geothermal heat pumps, I think that um, where they've really missed out is on is is understanding their grid value. They're they're viewed as building efficiency technologies, and they will never pay for themselves. I think that there's a great room to look at them as as grid cost and CO two management, uh, and to model to start with grid models and ex really expand. Uh, say, well, what happens if we if 20% of the homes have geothermal heat pumps, 20% of the businesses, and that'll generate what their real value is. And, and so I think there's a lot of, 
really interesting work out there to do for us to identify where geothermal is green and how to quantify it and capture its its value so that geothermal can be deployed to its maximum extent um, sooner than later. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, well, this was a no standing hour. There's still work to be done to find out how green is your thermal and to have a proper comparison against other technologies. And, but always to remember that we need a balanced energy matrix, but that requires a full understanding of externalities. Um, this is something that needs to be encouraged, not just wish or regret. Well, thank you to the organizers, to our excellent speakers and our remarkable audience. We'll see you in the next session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.